Lord. So good to see everybody here tonight, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, spirit, soul, and body. Uh, someone said, well, when you become a Christian, you don't have any problems. We, I think everybody here is Christians. Anybody have any problems over here besides me? Raise your hand, you've got some problems. If you're married, you've got problems. you got kids, you've got problems. <laughs> if you're in this world, you've got problems. <laughs> so, you got what? you got dish. You got issues? Okay, well, whatever you call them, that's good. She's got issues, the rest of us got problems. But anyway, isn't that so true? But you know, Jesus said, in the world you have tribulation, you have trials. He said, but cheer up. I have overcome the world for you. Amen. This is a little diagram of me when I was young. (laughs) Spirit, soul, and body. Now, we all know we're spirit beings. Amen. And we know that when one does pass away, their body is placed in the ground and their spirit goes to be with the Lord. And the spirit is saved, but the soul and the body, anybody in here that has a body that is saved, no, your body's not saved yet. That's future tense. When we get our resurrected body, then that part will be saved. Our souls, up in our mind, our thinking, all of the, that's not safe. So this is where our trouble comes, so out of our soul and out of our body. So you need to realize that we're spirit, soul, and body. And you have to identify if you have, do have problems or issues, where are they coming from? And, uh, and then once you identify where they're coming from, you can deal with them. Now everybody has this little diagram here. This, this is our inner man right here. See the inner man? That's really tremendous. We're the bride of Christ. But turn it upside down. Now, how you see yourself is important. If you see yourself like this, that's what the devil wants you to see. And you can't be happy looking like that. <laughs> you can't be happy. So... The enemy will try to make us feel like we're not loved, God doesn't really care about us. I mean, all kind of things. We know all the devices of the enemy. But you've got to see yourself in your mind. You've got to get your mind renewed and realize that we are born again. We've been set free uh, to serve the Lord and uh, that we are a new creation. Our spirit man has been uh, born again by the Spirit of God and so forth. So this is something that's important. When you look at the back, who you are, just turn it over real quick, like, and this is a good thing to go over to get your mind renewed, because the Bible says in uh, Proverbs 23, 7, King James, would you put that on the uh, board up there for us? King James, um, Proverbs 23, 7. Listen to what this says. I'm a child of God, I'm redeemed from the hands of the enemy. I'm forgiven. I'm saved by grace through faith, not of works, as any man should boast. I'm justified. That means that uh, just as if I've never sinned, I'm sanctified. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. Now, we go down that whole list. You can read that, but you've got to believe that. You've got to accept that, and you've got to meditate on that. Now, how many of you know that God's Word is a medicine even to our flesh, okay? There's power in the Word of God. So we believe and we get this in our heart. We get the Word of God in our heart. The Word of God is a seed. How many here plants a garden? Let's say you plant a garden of uh, corn. And the next day you go out there and you take the corn off and you eat it that evening. No, you plant the seed, it takes a little while for the stalk to come up, the corn to form, you got to keep it watered and everything like that, okay? So that's the way it is with the Word of God. You got to get the Word of God in your heart. See, we are, our bodies are really a garden, and we have to put the Word of God in there and plant the Word. Our job is to plant the Word of God in our hearts. The Holy Spirit will make it grow. It will come forth, but our job is to water it and nurture it and protect it, uh, protect it, and then what we say will come true. What we sow will come forth, okay? Remember that. Uh, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. 
So that's the first part of that scripture in Proverbs 23 that I want you to see. So we have to realize, so is a man thinketh in his heart. So what do we want to think? We want to think good thoughts about God. We want to th think good thoughts about others. We want to think good thoughts about ourselves in God. We are God's creatures. We've been born again. He loves us very much. And that's what we have to meditate. Now, when I first became a Christian 54 years ago, I didn't have this teaching. And I had a lot of issues and problems. <laughs> a double whammy. Uh, <clears throat> And, and, and bless Susan's heart, even before she was saved, she was a saint. <laughs> anyway, let's move on from that. <clears throat> but I was saved and still had a lot of devil in me, you know what I mean? And it took a while to, to get all those weeds out of this garden, you know what I mean? How many has ever cultivated a piece of ground and it had a lot of weeds? And boy, it's tough to hoe, it's tough to plant, you know what I'm talking about. So I had to get a lot of weeds like jealousy and rejection and, and uh, I don't feel like nobody loves me. Because all of those things you, I started thinking about and what I'm doing is I'm watering the negative things in me and I'm not watering the good things that God has put into me. Okay, So we have to reverse this thing. Now everybody has a, uh, on the thoughts. I want you to look at that. This is an absolute law. You know, we're going to be transformed, how? By the renewing of our mind. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2 talks about that. Presenting not bodies and so forth. But thoughts produce attitudes. Attitudes produce emotions. And emotion produces behavior, and behavior produces a lifestyle. Now I want you to think for a moment. We always try to change our lifestyle, but you've got to go all the way back. And what are you thinking? You've got to change your thinking if you're going to change your attitude. To change your attitude, you've got to think good thoughts. If you're going to change your emotions, how many people we have met over the years that their emotions just running wild? So what does that person has to do? They've got to go back and... What are they thinking? Because what they're thinking is developing an attitude, an attitude towards God, an attitude towards uh, their mates, or an attitude towards their children, an attitude towards the President of the United States, because they're thinking bad thoughts about that person, and actually they are producing bad attitudes in their own lives and bad emotions, and it's coming out of a lifestyle. How many see that? Raise your hand. This is so important that we understand that. You, you know, we talk about certain laws that we break. But see, this is a law right here, the thought process. If you're going to have victory in your life, you must think right. You cannot think wrong about yourself or anybody else and live in victory. Okay? Now, let's just work on that a little bit. Thoughts produce... All right, as I begin to think of how much God loves me, and I start thinking on that, then actually the Holy Spirit, and this is, remember, we don't, we don't come into our sanctification all by our little old self. The Holy Spirit is here to help us, but he's waiting for us to get our thinking in line with the Word of God. And so as we get our thinking in line with the Word of God, then he produces what the Word says, that we are in Christ. When you plant a garden, how many of you uh, makes the seed grow? You can't make the seed grow. Your job, plant it, water it. The Bible says some sow, some water, but what? God gives the increase. Now think about, it. we want good increase in our life. We want good attitudes to be formed. We want to have positive emotions. We want to have positive lifestyle. But we can't if we're still thinking on the negative. So you've got, we, that's why the Bible says we'll be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And how do we get our minds renewed? By beginning to think on what God tells us to think on. And you'll find that in Philippians chapter 4. Uh, hopefully we'll get to that later. 
But let me cover something because what I want to do tonight, uh, we know that our biggest enemy is the world, the flesh, and the devil, okay? And so we have to know how to uh, fight the good fight of faith. Now I'm going to read this. This is very important. Here's the prime intention of Satan is to bruise every person born in this world. We have an enemy, and you have to know his strategies. You have to know what he's trying to do. And he always comes to divide, to, de to kill, to destroy. So you have to know that we have an enemy, and you have to know how to fight that enemy because he puts a lot of thoughts in your mind. All the thoughts that go through your mind is not your thoughts. These are what the Bible calls fiery darts. So he puts, let's just, I'll pick on Roy tonight. Is that okay? You can talk to me after the service if it ain't, you know. But, but let's say that uh, Roy leaves the service tonight. Pastor Bob is picking on me tonight. And the, and the devil's, the devil said, yeah, he's picking on you. you know, I, yeah, man. And he, all night long, he can't go to sleep. He's thinking about Pastor Bob. He, Pastor Bob must be against me. He's picking on me. Now, how many of you know that's going to change his attitude towards me? Come on. Hmm? That's it. That's the way it works. And then that's going to affect his emotions. And then when he sees me, he's going to have a negative emotion about me. Hello, are you out there? Hmm? And then if you don't correct it, it becomes a lifestyle. And he keeps falling into that trap. Somebody else comes along, and he's picked up a complex now. And somebody says something, and he takes it wrong. And so he starts thinking about, what would that person say? And the devil says, yeah, he don't like you, you know. And all of a sudden, he's forming an attitude about this other person. And then it goes into his emotion, attitudes and emotions and his lifestyle. And I mean, it's on, that's the way it works. So you've got to clear, you've got to clear this old mind. I mean, you've got to wash it with the Word of God. You've got to take authority over a lot of your thinking. I preached a, a message one time on stinking thinking. And if you are thinking stinking thoughts, I love you, but you're going to what? You're going to what? Stink. <laughs> it's okay, say it. Stink. Come on, somebody say it. Very good. Right. Absolutely. What have you been thinking all day? Now let's go back. What have you been thinking all day? Because hmm? I guarantee whatever you have been thinking on a lot today has affected your attitude, your emotions, and your behavior pattern. Simple, not complicated. I always try to think on, on what Susan's going to fix for supper. That always excites me. <laughs> All right. The enemy wants to bruise. Uh, the next scripture I want you to put on the, on the uh, board would be Luke 4, 18. And let's read that. Luke 4, 18. Here we go. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Now, Jesus is speaking to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. There are people that, that are brokenhearted, and it affects their whole lives. It affects their physical life. It affects their, uh, their thinking. It affects their spiritual life. It really, I mean, it, it can bring, um, uh, one can have a nervous breakdown. So he's come to heal the brokenhearted, to preach Deliverance to the captives. Many people are captive by the evil powers of darkness. Uh, I've lived long enough. I've, I've worked in deliverance of, of evil spirits, casting demons out of people. A lot of times the demons are not inside, but the, the demons are around you. See? And they keep projecting these thoughts in your mind. Nobody loves you. Nobody cares about you. You'll never make it. You never was any good. And you start believing that, and you, listen to this, you develop a negative attitude about yourself, and then you begin to have a negative emotion about yourself, and then a lifestyle 
of rejection, rejecting yourself. You know, the Bible says that we are to love our neighbor as we want. Love ourselves. And if you don't love yourself, how can you love your neighbor? Now, we're not talking about a uh, sexual, a carnal uh, uh, love, but we're talking about loving ourselves as God's creation, as God's bride, as God's child. That's what we're talking about. And, how you, and, and the degree that you love yourself in God, with God's love, the agape love, there's a freedom there. You set your own self free. free. A lot of people are in bondage not knowing that they're keeping themselves in bondage by how they think. You got that? Very important. Check your thinking. It would be nice now just to put a little red bulb on everybody's head just to see what they're thinking right now. And every time you think a negative thought, it goes boop, boop. I tell you, we have a lot of boop boops in here. Even when you're in church, you can have a negative thought. While I came into the church at night and Pastor Bob didn't even hug my neck. Boop, 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 boop. <laughs> <laughs> what I was trying to get to you, but I couldn't. I was hugging other people's neck. But I'm talking about something as simple as that. And you start thinking about that, and, and you would say, well, he must love others more than then he loves me, and how many understand what I'm talking about? That's so true. And we all go through these experiences, so don't think you're the only one in the world. I'll guarantee you that we all are fighting the good fight of faith, but we have to take courage and realize that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. All right, let's finish this scripture. Jesus says, I've come to, to heal the brokenhearted, uh, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind. The Bible says, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. They're blind to the revelation knowledge of God. See, knowledge is very important. Knowledge about yourself, knowledge that you know that your spirit, soul, and body, how your soul works, how your, how your body works, that's so important. Uh, uh, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. How many bruises do you have in your life tonight? So let's talk about the bruises tonight. The purpose becomes evident as one sees that bruises give Satan place to do his destructive work in the life of the Christian. The scriptures say that bruises binds the person. But the work of Christ is to set at liberty them that are bruised. Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, came, in, came to undo the work of the enemy. And as long as that bruise is not healed, you can't be the person that you want to be. It binds you. It restricts you. Now, let's get down to things that, well, that, that we can really understand. How many in here has ever experienced fear? How many in here has never experienced fear? Nobody. Fear has torment. Fear of what's going to happen tomorrow. Fear that nobody's accepted me. Fear of not having enough money. Fear that I might die. I've been in places where I had fear that I might, wouldn't die. I'm like Job. I've had some Job experiences in my life. But fear has torment. But perfect love casts out fear. And the more that we can get grounded in God's love, the quicker we will walk in liberty. You have to know. That's why Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 3, somewhere along in there, and said, I pray that you might know the height, the depth, the length, and the width of God's love. Love has liberating power. 
And when, you, when that love is operating in your life, you have that love in you because the Bible says the love of God's been shed in our heart by the Holy Ghost. And as that love is released in us to love people, to love yourself, because you're never going to love anybody else until you first love yourself. That's, that's what you have to do. First, we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. All of the other commandments hinge on these two. Love, of course, you, you say, well, what does love look like? Read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 in the Amplified. It's powerful. But it took me a while. I was saying, going back when I was first saved, I, I had an alcohol uh, father. And usually if someone has an alcohol mother or father and the kids come along, they receive rejection. Okay? Uh, there's a lot of things that, that uh, the devil's looking, especially when we're young and we don't know how to fight the enemy and people are taking advantage of us. We're young. And, and, and then things happen. Dramatic experiences happen in our life. And, and, and we don't realize, but we get bruised. But then we go on in life, and we don't know we're bruised inside. And then later on, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we grow up, and we get married, and, and we're trying to live life. And, and, and you've you got to go back in your life. Sometimes you have to go back in your life. How many times you've been bruised, but those bruises have never healed? You know, it, it's amazing. The other day I, I was working with some wood and I got just a little splinter. I mean, a small splinter in my finger. And it hurt bad. How many ever had a, like a briar? And, and that little thing, it just hurts awful. And you've got to get it out. You've got to get it out because if you don't, it can become infected and cause other problems. So there's a time in your life it's not everything is not sin. There's many things that, 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 that we've been bruised as a young kid. We've been, uh, many people have been molested. They've been uh, raped. They, they, they've been, I mean, mistreated awful. And those bruises are in their lives. And they, uh, we've had them come to Susan and me over the years. And what's wrong with me? I feel this thing inside like it's tearing me apart. Yeah, I know. Now we've got to go back. And many times, let me say this, many times, and we're, we're young and we pick up resentment towards our parents because we feel like they didn't treat us right. And in fact, uh, we've dealt with people that actually hated their parents. But see, the enemy's working all along in their minds. Yeah, yeah, they didn't love you like the other children, you know. Partiality, they, they showed partiality, you thought they showed partiality. And that hurts you. That's a bruise. And this is why a lot of people act and react like they do. They don't understand what, what's going on in, inside of me. And it took a good while, it took a good while for, for God to work in me to come into this understanding that I had some bruises in my life, and yet God called me to preach. And little by little, God began to show me and heal me of these various bruises, and I could tell that my personality, uh, I was much happier. I didn't have that thing in sound like I'm being torn apart. I didn't have, I, in fact, I had a lot of deep anger in me. I mean, I mean, deep anger. Now, the Bible says, be angry, but sin not. But if you don't deal with that anger, it can build up what you call build up anger. And that causes you to act and react uh, towards certain people if you think that they are uh, showing partiality to you or treating you bad, and you can re start resenting them. So I look, I had to go back in my life. I had resentment towards my father. Uh, my father would, uh, for example, I'll give you a little illustration. One day we had a bunch of, bunch of my buddies were there. I didn't have no money in my pocket. He comes, he gives all the kids money. He didn't give me no money. I mean, you know, that's a bruise. I mean, I didn't have no money to buy bubble gum with. That's horrible. It is. But see, that hurt me deeply. Now, you're young. You, you don't understand these things. All of a sudden... Boom. 
You know, Frank shared this one day about apples. Apple, take an apple, you look on the outside, it looks beautiful. Beautiful apple. How many have seen a real beautiful apple and you just want to bite it? And you bite it, and you know what's inside? A bruise or even a worm. Huh? Have you ever tasted worms? <laughs> Protein is great. <laughs> but see, on the outside, that apple looks perfect. There's nothing wrong with that apple. And yet, when it dropped off the tree, a bruise. But then you go back, and when that flower, listen to this, when that flower was on that tree, and this little bug or fly or whatever comes, and he lays an egg in that flower, and then that flower closes up. Where's the bug? Inside the flower. And why it's inside the flower, that little bug or whatever he lays in there happens to be a worm. And that worm is, that apple forms and it's beautiful, but that worm is eating away on the inside. Eating away, eating the very life out of that apple. And you, and you go down to the store and you buy it. You say, man, look at all these nice apples that I've just bought. And you take one and you bite into it. And inside, there's a worm. How did it get in there? When that bloom, before that bloom, that little child comes along in life. And the devil lays that egg in there. And it hatches out. And the kid grows up. The person looks beautiful on the outside. I was dealing with a woman one time, Susan, we were dealing with this woman. And uh, <clears throat> she said in the chair, I says, well, what, what do you think? What's eating away at you? What, what's, what, what do you think that's wrong? I mean, she was beautiful. And you know what she told me? She says, I'm ugly. That's the way she saw herself. I'm ugly. Y'all take a look at that. Everybody pick your paper up, look at it. If you got an image of yourself, and you can be beautiful on the outside, and most of all you, got, all you guys are beautiful on the outside. There's only one person here I have a little question about. <laughs> That's me. <coughs> all right. Mm. Well, you know, I got age on me, so, you know, okay. But seriously, what are you going to think about yourself? If you see yourself, you got to change that image. You're a beautiful person. God has wonderfully made you. You are created in the image of God. You are beautiful. Now, you men are not, but I'm talking about the girls are beautiful. Now, the men are good looking. You've got to see yourself as God sees you. That's how God sees you. God counts those things that be not, what? As though they were. You say, Bob, I don't look like that. You've got to start calling those things that be not as though they were. That's your responsibility. So, I'm, I'm set back, you know, like this. She's a movie star on the outside. But inside, she felt so ugly. So as a man thinketh in his heart, so is that man. You know, I thought, well, Lord, this will be my first time to ever cast out an ugly spirit. But that wasn't a problem. It was not a demon in her mind. That's how she thought of herself all of her life. She developed an attitude about herself that she was an ugly person. It got into her emotions. She felt very negative about herself, which she reflect on other people. And she walked around beautiful on the outside, but she acted like an ugly person. And you've got to reverse it. That's why Jesus said, you will, you will be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. That is our responsibility. 
God won't do that. He saved our spirit. Our spirit is saved. But it's our responsibility to get our mind renewed and begin to see ourselves as God sees us. Now, there's two extremes of that. Some, there are these people, some people think they're ugly, they're no good, they're not as good as other people. And you can see it in their action. You can see it in their lifestyle. And you, you've seen that. Then there are those on the other side that think that they're it on the stick. How many have ever seen some people that think... <laughs> Huh? <laughs> huh? You know, you got to watch out for the devil, see? He'll land on your shoulder and say, you, you ain't no good, Bob. You're just a worm in the cabbage patch, you know? And you fight that for about two or three years, and you finally get rid of that one, you know, and you're beginning to feel good about yourself, you know? And all of a sudden, a little pride comes in, you know? And, man, you walk through the, with the brothers, you know? I got, I mean, I, you know, it on the stick now. Hallelujah. The devil's over here saying, yeah, man, you hit on the stick, man. You, you, I mean, you is something. I remember one time I was uh, sitting where you're sitting, and this preacher was preaching, and this little thing in my mind says, huh, I can preach better than him. And the devil over here said, yeah, you preach a lot better than that boy, poor boy can. See, huh, yeah, see. And then you got to get rid of that dude. No, balance. God is a balanced God. We don't want to think more highly of ourselves, as the Bible says, than we should. And then we don't want to think too lowly. Because if you think too lowly, you're going to walk like that. If you think too highly, you're going to walk like that. So you have to bring that balance. Who are we in Christ? We're children of God. We've been born again. God has put his spirit in us. And we have to, we have to realize that. I put that on zero. That'll get, get us going. All right, let me finish reading this a little bit. <clears throat> Innocent children who are a target of the enemy carry bruises throughout their life and are never free to be the person God intended them to be. Insecurities, bitterness, and rejection are evidence of the work of Satan in their life. The oppression of the enemy remains until... These works are revealed and undone. Now, we were talking about pride a while ago. And I remember years ago when we were at Yaman Hall Road. You remember that, uh, the, uh, the storefront? We had this guy that came, and, and I mentioned this before, but he's casting out demons, you know. And I'm sitting right over there where Roy was sitting. And he's trying to get people to come up. He's going to cast demons out of them. And I, and I thought to myself, man, I'm not going to go up there. I'm the preacher of this church. And if I go up there and he casts out a demon out of me, what is everybody else going to think? Say, so you got to, you got to, listen, you've got to want your deliverance more than anything in this world. It doesn't matter what people think. I'll tell you what people think in this church. They'll think good thoughts about you. Because I tell you, a lot of us have been through the grind, the grinding wheel We've had some rough times, and God has delivered a lot of us from a lot of things. No, we'll love you. We'll be the best friend you, you can imagine other than Jesus. But I'm sitting there, you know, and, and, and the Lord began to speak. He says, you need to go up there. I said, I ain't going up there, Lord. I don't know if you and God have a, ever have, how many of you ever had a little debate like that? Let me see. Look at the people who have had debates like that. So what I did, I said, okay, I'm going up there. I don't care what they think. So I go up there. He prays for me. Nothing happens. I sit down. I say, thank you, Jesus. I said, Lord, I didn't get delivered from anything. He said, yes, you did. I said, what? He said, pride. See, God gives grace to the pride. What? God gives grace to the humble. So if you want deliverance, if you want to be set free, you've got to submit, you've got to obey what the instructors say. You've got to humble yourself. And you know what? The Bible says God will give you grace upon grace and more grace. And Paul said this, I am what I am by the grace of God. 
And so you'll go through that process of, of, of humility and humbleness. But I tell you, when you come out on the other side of being delivered, here's what, you, you'll say the same thing that King David said. Here's what King David said. I went astray before I was afflicted. Catch it. But since I've been afflicted, I don't go astray anymore. Can we understand that? If you understand that, raise your hand. Good. Okay, that's good. Because there's something about, there's something about, um, well, the Bible says this, and I think it's in uh, 1 Peter 4, he that suffers in the flesh, uh, if you ever read that, you need to read that, but it says, ceases from sin. This is why discipline is good for us. I remember my dad, I would do certain things. He would spank me. Have you ever been spanked? That's good. I'm glad to see that. Did it do any good? Not much, right? Okay. But I tell you, afterwards, it, I, I was the best boy. I was good. You know what I mean? I was really was. About three weeks, and after that, you know, it's sort of like I needed another one. <laughs> but, but seriously, <clears throat> Things, you know, we think sometimes things are the most harmless things in the world that's happening, and yet those very thing, things that, that has happened in our life, the bruises, the rejection, you will come out on the other side with an understanding and a compassion in your heart for people that don't have the victory yet. Your life will be transformed all the things that have happened, the devil has uh, just seemed like wrecked your life, your marriage, your whole, everything is just upside down. And yet you go through that process, that sanctifying process, and let God work and be under the, uh, the, under the guidance of a good, good teacher to help you to walk through these different tough areas to be able to have that discernment to spot this particular thing that happened in your life. You'll come out on the other side a mature, compassionate person because you've been there. And when somebody comes into your presence that has just got so many bruises in their lives, you will understand and God will use you to help that person come into victory. Let's, let's move on real quick. Like Time is going by so fast I haven't got started yet. The body of Christ is suffering from the bruises of Satan. Bruises keeps the body divided and the enemy dwells in the land. People that are bruised have a difficult time of being joined together in a body. I want you to see something here. This is so important. How many's ever had a bruised arm? You had a bruised arm, okay. You always try to protect it. Is that not true? So if you've been bruised by the enemy, you don't want nobody to know it. Because see, the pride level has not been dealt with. So you hide that. No, I'm fine. I, nothing's wrong with me. I'm fine. And you're dying inside. You're just dying inside. Oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. But pride, see, before you can get delivered, we've got to deal with pride. Because the devil uses the pride. I want to say something, and no offense to the men, but men, we have a big ego. If you found that to be true, raise your hand. I'm going to see, be honest. Some of you are not going to be honest. Seriously. Boy, as a pastor, I had, I, had to, I had to let God deal with my ego. Nobody can preach but me. I'm, on, I'm telling it like it is. Do I have enough mature people can handle that in here? You know, I got to do everything. If it ain't done just like I want it to be done, oh, I'll go to, yeah. ego, ego. God, oh my goodness, God will put people in your path. And, he, and all of a sudden, they'll do something, and you don't like what they do. They're messing with my arena of what I'm responsible for. They're me out, out, and you go outside, and you pout, and you go home, and boy, I'm telling you, how many of you, God's doing you good. 
God's revealing ego in you. And the way you get victory is humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and let God lift you up. Oh, I could tell you story after story. I remember one time years ago when we were at the storefront, Sean, and you were about 20 or 21, I think, then. How old are you now? <laughs> so, you know, you're still young, 40-something, right? Man, we, I mean, that, the holy anointing was on me. I was casting out demons out of Susan. I mean, it was, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> boy, I had the anointing on me, man. I, I, come, I come out of the church building that night, you know. You know, man, I was, my ego was way up there, man. I was the man of the hour. Hallelujah. And anyway, when I got home, Susan cast it out. <clears throat> but anyway, <laughs> but, but anyway. This guy, this guy comes out, one of my dear brothers, comes out singing this song. <laughs> Though I can cast out demons, don't rejoice about that, but rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you know. And I went home, and I said, Susan, I've got to walk around the, the, the block. I'll tell you, God's dealing with me. And I'm walking around. It's nighttime. I'm walking around the block, and I'm complaining, you know, you know what complaining is, don't you? No, no you, uh, you guys don't do it. But, uh, Lord, I don't understand. You know, I mean, what he, he did, you know, blah, 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 you know what I'm talking about. I mean, I'm just, I'm complaining and murmuring, you know. This guy stepped right on the pastor's ego. And I'm mad. And I'm jealous. All kind of things begin to manifest. And God spoke. He says, are you going to moan all night? Or do you want me to cast it out? I stop. And so help me. I said, Lord, I want to be delivered. I can't let this ego direct me. I've got to be guided by the Holy Spirit, not my ego. Listen to this. The finger of God, I've seen it come down from heaven, boom, like fire, and circumcised my heart. I was set free. I love those type of deliverance, don't you? So I had that happen to me. And I thank God for that. See, you never know how God will work once, once you get committed and say, God, I want to be all that you want me to be. I want these bruises. I want these hurts. I want all of these bad feelings out of me. People are walking around with all kind of bad feelings. They resent this person. They resent that person. I mean, they just got all, you know what I, no, I'm, you guys don't know about that. But there are people like that and they don't know what's wrong and all this stuff is building up building up and then they die with a heart attack then they become uh some type of physical ailment breaks out in their bodies and they die way before their time because they didn't realize and didn't understand they didn't have the knowledge of what i'm teaching here tonight they never got their thought life under their control. When you read the Bible, there's things that only God can do, and there's things that only you can do. God's not going to study for you. Who's going to study for you? You're going to have to study. I mean, study. You say, well, I've read that before. I know John 3.16. I've been quoting John 3.16, and I'm still learning about John 3.16. You don't ever hear it enough. Well, I've read that chapter before. Folks, you read it until it becomes a rain rainbow word. When it becomes rainbow, it becomes alive to you. It, it puts power in your spirit, man. You know that you know that you know. Let's move on real quick. Like, Listen to this. We are a product of our total life experience. Our reactions to present situations are determined by past experience. I have a, a teaching here on... Uh, <clears throat> how how many has ever heard of defense mechanisms? Defense mechanism. Let's see your hands. Ever heard that? Okay. Defense mechanisms can be good or bad. If somebody has treated you bad, and every time you see that person, 
and they treat you bad, you're going to build a defense mechanism. When you see that person, you're going to walk on the other side of the sidewalk, and you don't want to see that person. Come on, I'm speaking truth now. Is that not true? Anybody in your mind, you know, it might be your father or your mother. It might be your husband, your wife. You actually, we develop these defense mechanisms, and, and therefore we're protecting ourselves. And that person has hurt me 20 times, and he's not going to hurt me 21 times, and so you want to get away from that person. And, and those defense mechanisms have to be torn down. Like I say, some defense mechanisms are good, but some of them are bad, okay? Because... You're going to hide your wounds and your bruises and your hurts and your rejection. Why, some people even have lust. When I say lust, everybody thinks about sexual lust. How about lust for, let me see, I don't want to step on nobody's toes. Somebody help me out. Lust for everything you see. Uh-oh. Somebody say food. Got you. Yeah, you can have lust for food, lust for wealth, lust for prestige, lust for everything you see, you want to buy. <laughs> I took Susan uh, and the girls, I shared this with you uh, not too long ago about Susan and the girls thought I needed a couple new suits. And uh, I had to go to the Lord about that, and the Lord and me wrestled a little bit, and Finally, I got the message from the Lord that I was going to go with a good attitude. See, I had to change my thinking. Come on now. I don't want to go to belts. Every time I go to belts, my credit card seems to go high. I don't need no more suits. I got one suit. That's enough. But the girls, I say girls, I'm talking about my wife and my, my, two of my daughters. They just love. See, I knew, I knew, I knew what I was going to have to go through. My defense mechanism jumped right up there. And I'm in, I got my defense. They're not going to drag me down there. Well, anyway, the next day we were down at Belts. <laughs> and I knew that I was going to have to try on at least 20 pairs of pants and try 20 coats before they finally say, Dad, let's go back to that first one. <laughs> So you have to take your, you take your shoes off, you put the new suits on and everything, got to put the shoes. I mean, I got exercise that day. But I want you to know, before I went down there, I took all my defense mechanisms. I am meat for the dog. I am going to be gentle as a lamb. Whatever they say, I will obey. Come on, church. I'm saying something here. <clears throat> and I was a good boy. So I took them all out to lunch, and my credit card went up a little higher. But, uh, but you see, I had to gear my mind to it because that defense mechanism, I don't know what it is. It was probably years ago it got built up. I don't like to go shopping for clothes. Any, any men in here besides me? Let me see your hand. One, two, two, three back there, you know. So, you know what I'm talking about. And you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta tear that defense mechanism down and say, get your mind thinking right, develop the right thinking, right attitude, right emotions, right lifestyle. And I tell you, I went, I was a good boy. We had a great time. I love my girls. They're in their 50s. And uh, anyway, so I said, well, this is it. I got my suit. And they say, oh, Dad, we're going to go over here and check some dresses. I said, okay, darling, where's the seat at? I'm going to get, find me a chair somewhere. So I found me a chair right at the, at the entrance of, of belts. There's a chair. So I'm sitting there. This old man is sitting there. And I'm seeing these girls come in. And they got these dresses right there at the, at the door when the girls, because, see, when once they get in the store, they got to start looking and feeling those dresses. You know, and I, so help me, everyone that came in, I grabbed that dress, look at the price, went over there, and I, I, I said, this is awesome. I'd love to have a camera, you know what I mean? Every one of them, and they went through all those dresses, checking the tags and the cloth and putting it out like this and out like that. I said, and I'm like, 
they actually loved this. They liked this. They loved it. Anyway, an hour and a half, the girls came back. Of course, I was asleep by that time. So you have to learn. See, I wear these dark glasses. <laughs> anyway, how many of you can identify? But what I'm saying is, see, I had built up a defense mechanism, and I had to tear it down and renew my mind and say, I'm going to behave myself and do it. Now, that's how you humble yourself. When somebody tells you to do something you don't want to do, you humble yourself and you do it, and that's how you get free. Because that's what you call the cross. The cross will begin to cut and deal with that old man's attitude, and you submit. You know, it's really, uh, it's really simple. The old song we used to sing in the Baptist church, Rust and obey. <laughs> oh, 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 I'm sorry. Trust and obey. <laughs> Listen, I'm telling you, there is no other way. Period. And the quicker you learn that and submit. In fact, the Bible says, submit yourself one to another. Pray one for another that you might be healed. And so as we practice the Word of God. Now, uh, I want you to turn, if you will, put it up on the board for me. Um, it's um, 2 Corinthians 7 1. Okay? 2 Corinthians 7 1. And the time is running out, and I haven't even begun yet. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dear to be loved, let us cleanse, now he's talking to Christians, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's powerful. Now there's two parts of sanctification, the part that God does for us when we're saved. But there's the part that we have to do in cooperating with the Holy Spirit and cleanse ourselves. Did you know I don't look at TV no more? So, so you don't understand. Before I was afflicted, I watched TV. Now, y'all can keep watching it. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying you can't watch it. But I'm saying that, I'm saying that at some point, when you're watching TV, your spirit and your flesh... I mean, it's just going to get just saturated with the negative things that they have on TV today. Now, I've really stepped out of line tonight, haven't I? I had this one young man who came to me and says, I've got this lust. You know, I just lust women all. I just lust, 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 lust. I said, what you watching on TV? Well, you know, 12 o'clock at night, the wife is asleep. She called me one night. I don't do it no more on my TV. I, I got my computer now. I said, well, you can keep watching it. All you're going to do, let me tell you something, you're just going to fill yourself up with more of all of that lust. See, what you yield to becomes your master. What you feed lives and grows. So you've got to make a decision. Well, Brother Bob, you're telling me not to look at my TV. No, I'm not telling you. I'm just simply saying that the devil and a lot of stuff will feed your flesh. You see, I watch TV before I was afflicted. You, you don't understand. And, but since I've been afflicted, I don't watch TV no more. Now, that didn't happen overnight. I remember one time when, when I was living at Middlecliff Avenue, and uh, we just got... Uh, I don't know, this, this, this woman is, was on TV, no clothes on. I'm sitting in the chair, seriously, I'm sitting, and I'm looking, hey, no clothes on, you know? And I tell you, my, I, I, see, I just couldn't push that little, what is that little thing you hold, that little, what is that little thing called? Remote, is that what that is? I was wondering what that was. See, we used to have to get up and turn, turn it off. <laughs> yeah, that's what that was. I, we had one. That, but my finger, my thumb just couldn't, you know. Susan walked in the room, and my thumb went into double time. 
This is Channel 5. We were reporting the bad news down here on King Street. Three people got killed and one got hurt badly. <laughs> See, you, 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 husbands and wives, you got to help one another. Oh, thank God for my godly wife. She helped me in that area. You see, we're all grown-ups here, aren't we? We've got one young person, but she's 13. Yeah, she probably knows more than we all know. <laughs> this young generation, you know. See, our, see, see uh, desire for the opposite sex is, is, is not a sin. That's the way God made it. You've got to understand that. But it's got to be done in marriage, you see. See, when you get married, I love it. You know, you pull the shades, lock the door. But you'll get, you'll get hungry after three days. <laughs> Some of you probably be a little short, a little longer. But you'll get hungry. Isn't there something else in life besides sex? Not much, but there is something. <laughs> but, but, but seriously, see, the bed is undefiled. It's holy. It's precious. I've been married 58 years, and my wife, we're madly in love. I, I can't wait to be with her when she goes shopping. H hurry back, darling. I'm serious. <laughs> hurry back to Daddy. I'm waiting on you. You think I'm crazy. I'm sorry, but I'm happy. Oh, I'm happy. I got a good marriage. And she's the same way. She's the same way. Now, I don't want this to get out, but, you know, we at the house, and, and I'll take her by the hand sometimes. <laughs> put my arm around her. She puts her head on my shoulder. And we just, we don't move, we just dance like this. <laughs> isn't, this isn't this wonderful? Oh, yes, honey. <laughs> I mean, we just enjoy being together. And by that time, the phone rings. <laughs> Used to be the kids are knocking on the door. Now the phone <laughs> rings. <laughs> All right, I'm getting off track here. But, but I, I, I want to point out that, that, you see, I'm saying that because, see, this goes on tape, and we've dealt with young ladies that actually felt that they couldn't have a godly sexual relationship with their with their husband because their father, or well not their father, but their mother would say, that's filthy, that's horrible, you don't ever want to do that. I mean, and, and when they get married, they can't release themselves to their, hu their husbands. Uh, do we understand that a little bit? See, the mind, all that got in the mind, and their at the, the attitude formed, and the emotion, and it's nasty, it's horrible, it's not good, and so they could not really, really relate and become one see it's actually it's actually the, the confirmation of the marriage folks is not when the preacher announces you man and wife but when you go into the chamber with your spouse that's when that's that's when the marriage the confirmation you read about Isaac read the story about Isaac when he married his, his wife. Okay. Some of you want to throw me out of the church, I know. <laughs> All right, let's move. I got, I got three minutes, and I'll let you go. Okay. Our perception of the present time cannot be, can be distorted by past hurts. This one minister told me there, a woman actually sat in the congregation for five years because a preacher had hurt her and she could not trust any preacher that was in her mind. That was a stronghold. See, that was a defense mechanism built up. I can't trust any preacher because that last preacher, but she needed help so bad. She was hurting so bad. But five years, see, that trust, you have to develop a trust with one another because a trust is like a bridge. And both of you begin to walk across that bridge together. And you begin to trust one another. You begin to come. See, the enemies come to divide, to kill. We had a 
funeral here Monday, 23, 24 years old. I forgot the age, 24. Somebody breaks the door and boom, 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 shoots him dead. That's the enemy. Satan kills in many different ways. There are people walking around like robots, all inside. They're hurting. And sometimes they build that shield of um, defense mechanism. Have you ever seen somebody real tough? Hmm? Raise your hand. Have you seen somebody real tough? That's a defense mechanism. So you won't hurt me because you, you'll get it yourself before you hurt me. You see, they're hiding behind that. People hide behind those masses. They hide. And that's the devil's scheme to paralyze the whole church. Starting as a young age, we've dealt with people that begin to take rejection in when they were in their mother's womb. Maybe the mother had four or five kids, and after that, you know, you can pretty well say, I don't want any more kids, and, and all of a sudden you get pregnant again, and you say, I don't want this kid. You know, you, you start building a, an opposition defense mechanism against this child. That child's picking it all up in its little spirit. It knows in the wound that, that the mother don't want it, but she really does, but she's stressed out, you know, with five or six kids, and but nevertheless, people don't realize they're hurting that little child in there. And that child is born, bruised, why? Yet in the mother's womb, it begins to move in life and always feeling rejected, always taking the back seat, always just don't feel just like I'm accepted. That's one thing that we try to do here at The Shield, accept people just like they are. And love them back to life. Some people have been so hurt. You have to love them back to life. They're hurt that deeply. Well, there's a lot of things I can share, but we've run out of time. Father, I want to thank you that I hope that some way that I've been able to share a few things to help people. And we'll... Let this be a series of teaching uh, along the way. But Lord, you've come to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly. And we cannot enjoy that life many times because many of us have been bruised and hurt very deeply. And we act and react according to those hurts. And I just want to thank you now for that victory. In Jesus' name. Okay, you can cut the t tapes off.